Welcome to Canon Conversation number 754. In uh, Acts uh, 17, 22, and 23, Paul talks to the Athenians and he says that I perceive that in all things, all things, ye are too superstitious. And then the next verse he mentions, he gives an example, it's saying that they've got They've got all these gods that they worship, and they've even got one called the Unknown God. So he says, well, I'm going to tell you about this Unknown God, and he tells about the Lord Jesus Christ. But um, I wanted to focus on that term, ye are in all things. I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Uh, you're basing your beliefs on superstition rather than on fact. And that is... Well, I mean, that's the case among the uh, atheists and those types of uh, the unbelievers. But the bad part is it's uh, the case among the religious people, the so-called church uh, or so-called Christianity. Because um, you'll see that when you look at... Um, you look at what they believe because... And this is, you know, it's funny because I'll come across, sometimes I get atheist. I did a series on um, the God Delusion book by Richard Dawkins. And so sometimes I get atheists who will watch those videos especially, and they'll respond. And, of course, most of my videos I'll get comments from people who are in churchianity. And, and I found that... I can get through easier to an atheist than to get through to a person in churchianity. Now, usually you can't get through to either one, but at least the one, at least the atheist seems to be more, um, less based upon superstition. And that's the problem among churchianity is that they say they believe the Bible, but each denomination has their own spin they put on things. The, the Bible isn't their final authority. What they do is they've got a church statement that maybe was developed 200 years ago or this statement of faith and they base their their beliefs on that and then they, they change the Bible to match their statement of faith rather than changing their statement of faith to match the Bible. And I think it's a, it's a good illustration because what Paul is doing in Acts 17 is he's not talking to the unbeliever. Well, I mean, he's talking to unbelievers, but he's not talking to your typical atheist, secular humanist. The, the people there in Athens were known as philosophers. It says in Acts 17 that they like to gather to hear some new thing. And you notice in his crowd, he actually does get some of them to believe, it seems like. Or, but, but most of them say, well, we'll hear you about, we'll hear you on this the next day. All they want to do is philosophize and talk about things. And, and so they're relying not upon fact, but upon superstition. And that's what churchianity does. See, the problem is a lot of people, they look at, especially the atheist, and this is... This is where I can get through. At least there's a there's a crack in the atheist argument that, um, and I say that they're not willing to let me through because they um, their so-called science, First Timothy six twenty opposition of science falsely so called. The atheist so-called science is not real science. They're um, they're believing in superstition as well. But at least they seem to have more of a rational type view because the typical person in churchianity does things based upon feelings and emotions. The problem is the churches churches realize that they can get more money and more people uh, if they if they appeal to your emotions than if they appeal to your logical thought because you, you see that in everything like for sports for example that's a big deal here in Alabama. Alabama football is huge and they get you'll get people they'll pack out the stadiums and they'll pay hundreds of dollars per ticket to go to these games um, they'll pay hundreds of dollars for uh, to be able to watch them on TV or to have these big parties for the football and it's all basically it's all about feeling good is what it is it's not about 
you know, they're, they're not sitting around saying, well, let's do a Bible study and let's see what God's Word says and let's learn that. Uh, you know, they're, pay, they're paying all that money to feel good. The emotions. Uh, and, and so churches realize the same thing. If they, your flesh, Galatians 5.17 says, your flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. Your flesh hates the Bible, absolutely hates it. And so when you get in a Bible study, it's very easy to start to fall asleep reading or um, get bored or your mind starts to wander and say, oh, I need to wash a load of clothes. Oh, I need to mow the grass. Oh, I need to, you know, fix my lunch for the week. It's, you know, something. You always got something in your mind where when you sit down, you thought, oh, I got, I've got some time, I can read God's Word. And then you start reading and a minute in, you're thinking of all the things you could be doing instead of reading God's Word. Um, and if you do read it, you say, oh, I gotta, I'm reading through the Bible in a year, I gotta get through my chapters. And so you, and you get through them anyway, it's more or less like a, like a guilt thing. You're reading it out of guilt. You feel like, I gotta do this. And so when you do it that way, you're not really reading to understand it, to learn from it. You're reading to just ease your guilty conscience, and, and so they, and so when they do that, then you don't see the scriptures. People who get in the right division, yeah, it's clear that the the mystery was given to Paul. He says in First Corinthians nine, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. He says in Romans sixteen twenty five, uh, he's preaching preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret but now is made manifest Acts 3 19 18 19 20 21 you see Peter talking about how he's preaching what was the prophets have been preaching since the world began um, in Ephesians 3 Paul says about how he has given the mystery to give to us Colossians 1 it talks about how it's given to the mystery given to fulfill the Word of God um, you can you can see things that differ between the prophecy and the mystery programs where in mystery Romans 5 tells us we've justified by his blood now we have the atonement now and um, in Acts 3 and in 1st Peter 1 it says that Israel doesn't get the atonement until Jesus second coming there are all kinds of differences between the prophecy and mystery programs and they're all in your Bible but yet people will read it all their lives and never see it. My, my grandmother read the Bible through Genesis to Revelation every single year for probably 50 years in addition to Bible studies, things at church because she went to at least 10,000 church services in her life. So everything she heard at those churches, uh, at those church services and then her reading her Bible on her own as well. Um, she did all of that and yet she never saw the mystery. Well, she read, I'm sure she read, she read Paul's epistles through at least 50 times in her life, probably more than that, and yet she never saw the mystery, even though the verses are there. And the problem is, we're not reading God's Word to learn what it says, but we end up being too superstitious. You know, a lot of times, like with the, with the uh, God Delusion book, and I recorded those, um, those videos to show that those things are um, they are um, you know that they're not based upon fact that they're based upon just the religion of science they don't have evidence of these things and so then I get these atheists who come along and try to show me well no no that's not the case this is real science and and they have this idea that Christians are just based upon myth and superstition. The problem is since churches are based, they base things on emotions. It's very easy for them to, um, they won't, when you go to a, and this is why it's easier to reach the atheist, I think, than it is to reach somebody who's steeped in churchianity. Because if you try to show them scripture that is against God's, against what they're what their church has taught. They're not going to believe God's word. They're going to believe their church because their salvation in their mind is an emotional experience. I mean, salvation is 
simply recognizing your sin and trusting in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin. Uh, it's a very logical, rational thing where you, you take an objective look at yourself and you say, I'm a sinner. And you say, I have no power to overcome my own sin. I'm going to go to God. I'm going to ask God how I can, since I know God created me, He has the eternal power, so I'm going to ask God how I can get out of this. Since I can't pay for my sin myself, I can't work my way to heaven, I'm going to ask God. And then God says that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him, Hebrews 11:6. And so then God will show me that His Word, you know, the Gospel. So I take a rational, logical approach to see that I have sinned and come short of the glory of God and that the wages of sin is death. And then I take a rational, logical approach to see, okay, what, how can I get out of that situation? And I can look to Islam or Buddhist or Hinduism or Judaism or uh, Catholicism or Churchianity and I can see these different uh, so-called ways to get to heaven and all of them involve me having some kind of work. You know, even when, even when they tell you to pray, a lot of times there's this idea that, well, you got to pray through. You know, you got to keep praying until you pray through, until you reach the very throne room of heaven. Even that's, they make prayer a work that I got to, you know, sweat enough or be praying long enough. In the church I grew up in, if someone, if someone went to the altar and prayed uh, and they got up 30 seconds later, well, then nothing happened then. But if they were down there for 15 minutes and they were shouting, praising the Lord, speaking in tongues, well then, they got through. They prayed through somehow. See, even they make the prayer an emotional thing. They say you got to walk an aisle, that you got to promise to make Jesus the Lord of your life, invite Jesus into your heart, turn from your sins, uh, you know, all these different things. They say get water baptized, pray the sinner's prayer. They have all this emotional type thing when really salvation is all about I take an honest look at myself I see that I have sinned I've come short of the glory of God that there's no way that I can save myself I can look at what everything man is saying and how he wants me to work and I can see that work don't work because I can't get to heaven based upon my works because I'm a sinner and so then I ask God for the solution and he says trust in Jesus death burial and resurrection as atonement for your sin 1st Corinthians 15 3 and 4 and then by looking at a rational logical approach I say well that works because I've recognized my sin and I've recognized I can't get out of my sin and now you tell me that Christ that God sent his son Jesus Christ made of a woman made it and so now he is the um, he can pay for my sin so I know God can rise above my sin and he can send his son to pay for my sin and since he was a man then he can be that kinsman redeemer and so now I have eternal life by trusting in Jesus death burial and resurrection as atonement for my sin all of that makes rational sense but the problem with churchianity is they're basing their things on emotions or superstitions it's if I walk an aisle if I say a prayer if I promise to do better next time, if I say I'm going to make Jesus the Lord of my life, if I say I'm going to invite Jesus into my heart, or if I say I'm going to join the church and I'm going to serve the Lord from now on, then all of that isn't based upon a uh, rational, logical approach. It's based upon superstition. To think that I can somehow do these things and follow this formula in order to be saved. And the problem is, so, and so then what happens is because they make it an emotional experience, um, people feel real good about that. So they, you know, they start crying and they feel like, oh, the weight of sin has been taken off of me. I feel this, un, you know, I've unburdened it and it feels good. And so then they equate that to now if I share that they weren't really saved because they never trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection alone as atonement for their sin. They're not going to believe it because they've got this emotional experience behind it. Or maybe it's the speaking in tongues. Or maybe it's the feeling good when they get water baptized. Or maybe it's joining the church. Or maybe it's paying the tithes. Or 
Maybe it's some kind of experience of a fake healing where I felt like, you know, I was, um, I had this problem and then they prayed for me and now the problem went away. So then I was so-called healed. And so I know then whatever the church says must be true because I was healed. My grandmother went back to the time when she, she felt like she levitated above the ground. And, uh, and so you couldn't tell. Or there was a time when someone in the church picked up a hot coal from a stove and brought it around and showed everybody and it didn't burn her. And so, didn't burn her hands. And so based on this experience, they'll say, well, the church must be true. God must be present in the church because I saw that person with that coal and they didn't get burned. Or I saw, you know, this person who was into drugs and alcohol and just really had a messed up life and now God changed them around. They don't do that anymore. So whatever the church says must be true. They're not basing it upon fact. You don't, usually in most churches, they don't tell you, they don't get you to recognize your sin and to trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin. They may get you to recognize a sin, like there is something bad in your life, like the drugs or the alcohol or whatever it is. And if I walk an aisle and say the prayer and promise to do better next time, then God will help me and he'll help deliver me over that one little sin. So then I've got, and then, you know, maybe that happens. And maybe there have been people who have, who have now been sober for many years when, uh, after they walked that aisle and said that prayer. And so now they think, well, anything the church says must be true because here you are coming and saying that the gospel I believed is not the true gospel or what the church is teaching is not true. And I know it's true because I had the emotional experience of being delivered from alcoholism or, or um, now, you know, I can keep a steady job or, you know, whatever it is, I'm a better person now because they'll tie it to one thing you get deliverance from that one thing. That's why a lot of these churches have their celebrate recovery on a Friday night maybe and they get together and they celebrate how God has delivered them from whatever addiction it is that they had. And, and what they do then is now they're tied to that emotional experience so that when you try to show them doctrine that is contrary to what they teach, they're not going to believe it. Yeah. And the problem is, of course, you can't see your flesh can trick you. Your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, Jeremiah 17, 9 says. So your heart can deceive you into thinking that you've, you're following the truth. But you can have deliverance from alcoholism without ever reading a scripture, without ever mentioning Jesus. Alcoholics Anonymous, they do it all the time. Uh, people are sober. Uh, at, you know, this many years sober because they went through the program, not because they walked an aisle or said a prayer. And so then they feel good about themselves, but they don't attach it to God. And that is actually better because then you could say, you could show them that your problem isn't a sin. Your problem is that you are a sinner, that you have a sin nature. And while you and your own flesh may be able to overcome a sin, like say alcoholism, you can't overcome your sin nature problem. But the problem is churchianity because they've got their beliefs aren't based upon logical, rational approach, but it's superstitions based upon emotionalism. Now you can't share right division or you can't share a clear gospel with them because they're never, even though you've got the scripture, when right division and eternal security was shared with my grandmother for the first time, it was shared with me and my uncle for the first time also. She had read Paul's epistles 50 times, she never saw it. She read the entire Bible 50 times at least. And um, she did not have scripture to show, she did, could not prove from the scripture that what the guy was saying about eternal security and right division was not true. Even though she's read it so many times, she couldn't prove it. But yet she would say, I know what I know. That's what it is. You can't tell her anything different because she levitated that one time or she feels the blessing of the Holy Ghost when she speaks in tongues every single day. It's all this emotion involved. That's just like here in Alabama. Alabama football is a big thing and they got the rivalry of Alabama versus Auburn. And if you're on one side or the other, you can, you can argue till you're blue in the face about how that team is terrible and they're, and they're not going anywhere. 
and a true fan will never listen to you because they're not looking at things. They're not an Alabama fan because it's a logical, rational approach where they're going to say, this is the best team in all situations, therefore I'm rooting for them. No, they're, it's got some emotional tie. Usually it's, I went to the school there. Or, um, you know, I had this great feeling when they won the, the championship or they won this big game. And, you know, it brought me closer to my, my father. My grandfather was, um, I'm an L.A. Dodger fan. And I probably always will be. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that me and my grandfather were, my grandfather was a Dodger fan. And we watched together when I was a kid and saw the Dodgers win the 1988 World Series. Kirk Gibson hitting that home run to end game one. One of the greatest um, moments in sports history. And uh, we, I shared that with my grandfather. So I've got this emotional tie. So I don't like the Dodgers because they're the best team. I like them because my grandfather was a Dodger fan and I had a good emotional feeling over that. Um, I'm an Alabama fan, uh, not because they're the best team, but because my wife was an Alabama fan. And so we had good feelings over watching Alabama together. So you get this emotional tie. It's not that you're doing it by truth, but you're doing it by emotions. And, you know, with Alabama and Auburn and those teams and Dodgers, people can understand that. They can understand that's an emotional type. But the problem with churches is it's an emotional thing, but then they bring in God's Word, twist it around to make it fit what they believe, to fit their superstitions. And so now they will, people will never believe what you say about God's Word because the people's belief on God's word isn't based upon logical, rational approach. It's based on the superstition of how they felt good when they walked the aisle. Or this is the church that my father or my grandfather was in, or my mother or my grandmother, and she was such a sweet lady. So I know that this is the truth. And to abandon what they believe for the truth of right division or a clear gospel, it's like forsaking your own family. And so, because they've got an emotional tie to it. Paul told the Athenians, I, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. And that's how it is with people of churchianity today. That's why it's hard to share right division or share a clear gospel. And they won't believe it. It may be clear from scripture, but that's not what they're care. They don't care about the truth. They care about feeling good. And um, they don't feel good when you tell them that you're a sinner and there's absolutely nothing you can do to be saved. And so they, they don't like that. Thanks for watching.